Our scripture reading is Luke chapter 3. I'm not going to read all of chapter 3 because it's a whole chapter. Uh, but we're going to be going through the Gospel of Luke from here all the way to Easter and probably afterwards. So I do encourage you to be reading the Gospel of Luke. We're, we're not going to be going through every verse, chapter and verse. We'll be jumping a little bit. But we're journeying through the Gospel of Luke. And before we even get to the passage, I, I want to remind you of what's been happening so far. Jesus was born. We heard that story a couple weeks ago. And, and not only was he born, then he was introduced. And, and this is a, the, the series of introductions. If we read more of the second chapter of Luke, we would see his family bringing Jesus to the temple where Simeon sees him and Anna sees him. Uh, and they were promised they would see the Messiah before they die. And Simeon said wonderful words about who Jesus is, and Anna expresses this delight in seeing Jesus. We're introduced. And, and a little bit later, we have um, Jesus and his whole family going again to Jerusalem for a religious uh, festival. He's about 12 years old at this time. And maybe you remember the story that as they're leaving, it's a couple of days and they realize that Jesus is not with them. So they have to rush all the way back to Jerusalem and see him at the temple. And he was teaching and amazing everyone. And he said, didn't you know I would be at my father's house? We get a further introduction, this picture of who Jesus is. So that's, that's all been happening in the Gospel of Luke before we get to this point right here. And this is a, a chapter, chapter 3. And it feels like we're starting a whole new story. Uh, because it starts, the first verse says, In the fifteenth year of the reign of the emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Eturia, and Trachonitis and Lysanias, ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Cephas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Did you see the turn that Luke did? Before, everything was focused on Jesus. We had a little bit about John when his parents, Elizabeth and Zechariah, were told that they were going to have a child. And Zechariah had this wonderful song about him. And when, when Mary went to visit Elizabeth, she could feel John leap in her womb. So we... We know that John is there, but the focus has been so much on Jesus that we would think that's where the next step is going to be. But instead we have these listing of, of the time and who the rulers are and putting everything in historical context. And giving us that sense that this is happening in a real moment in time. And we're told the word of God came to and we expect to hear Jesus and we hear John son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And so our attention is pulled away from Jesus to John the Baptist. Uh, they don't call him John the Baptist. That's a title that we've given him later um, because of his baptizing. Um, he wasn't the first Baptist, just so you know that. Don't think of our, we started with John the Baptist. It, uh, that's another story for another time. So we have this this move away from Jesus. And that maybe, maybe makes us wonder, but we'll stay with Luke. We'll trust him. We'll see, where are you going to lead us next? So the word of, of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, calling people to change, calling people to renew their relationship with God, Calling people to a place where whatever they've done in the past would be forgiven, would be washed, would be clean, and they can start again anew. We had a wonderful, lengthy conversation about this in the Bible study class last week, about the Jewish practice of baptism. And, and it, 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 we learned so much, and part of what I learned was what John the Baptist was doing was a very Jewish thing. He saw that people had strayed from God, that the nation had strayed from God, that there was this unrest, there was this, this sense of not knowing where they were going. And John the Baptist knew they needed to get back to being right with God, and baptism was a way of doing that. 
It's a way of getting this, this second chance, this baptism of repentance, of changing who you are. So now we're in verse 4. This took me this long just to get three verses. Verse 4, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah. I want to remind you. So John the Baptist is out there preaching this baptism of repentance as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah. And here's what comes from Isaiah. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth all, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. John the Baptist is being placed in the tradition of the prophets and especially the tradition of Isaiah calling the people to change, to be made new, to prepare themselves for the way that God has for them. And there's these words of hope of what will come from this. Remember how this chapter started? I, I, I'm not going to read all the names because you noticed probably that I was stumbling over a bunch of them. But it starts with, in the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius. Not a Jewish leader, but a Roman leader. John is coming and speaking into this time of oppression. This time when they don't have the freedoms they desire. This time of feeling separate, of distance, of being in exile from their righteousness and their way of walking with God. Now here is the fun part. So now we get a sense, a taste of the kind of preaching that John offered. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers! I always wanted to read that in a nice, you brood of vipers, but that doesn't seem to be, you don't say that nicely, do you? You brood of vipers? Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our ancestor. He's saying, don't just feel like because you were born of a certain uh, ethnicity, because you were born in a certain family, you're gonna be fine. You can't say that. And he says, for I tell you, God, is able from these stones to rise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. This baptism of repentance that John is calling the people to, it's not this nice, like, come on to the waters, be clean. It's more of you need to repent. Repent of your wickedness, repent of your sin, repent of who you are. Come and be baptized in the water or be thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, this is verse 10, what then should we do? In reply, he says to them, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. Whoever has food must do likewise. Be nice, share. There must have been this sense at the time that you just need to focus on yourself and take care of yourself. And John is saying, at the least that you can do is to think about your neighbor. If you can at least do that much, maybe there's hope. This next verse is great for all the uh, people that work for the IRS. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. And they asked him, teacher, what should we do? And he said to them, collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers asked him, and we, what should we do? He said to them, do not exhort money from anyone by threats or false accusations, and be satisfied with your wages. So we have this picture of who John the Baptist is, and this picture of someone who's preaching this baptism of repentance, calling people out to who they are, but then also telling them they need to live a better life. And, and, and maybe we start to think this is the person we need to be focusing on. I mean, all that stuff about Jesus before was certainly interesting. But John the Baptist is doing something. He's making things happen. He's changing lives. He's bringing people back into this way of God. He's going to bring Israel back to its place of prominence. He's going to bring the temple back to its place of prominence. He's going to bring all of the people back to their place of prominence. We need to follow John the Baptist. That might be the way we read it. Verse 15. As the people were filled with expectation. 
And all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah. You can understand why they would think that, right? Isaiah sets him up. His preaching is calling people. The what, what he's doing, how he's baptizing, is changing life. You can understand why people would look at John and say, maybe he's the one. Maybe he's the Messiah that we have been anticipating. And John answered them by saying, I baptize you with water. But one who is coming is more powerful than I. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his garney. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. John says, you know, what I'm doing is just a start. But you wait. Just you wait till Jesus shows up. Although he didn't know the name was Jesus, the Messiah. Just you wait till the actual Messiah comes up, because what I'm offering is easy compared to what he's going to do. The kind of baptism I'm going to call and calling you to do, that's going to be comfortable compared to the baptism he's going to bring. And if you aren't righteous, if you aren't right in the way of the Lord, he will know his idea of the winnowing fork and the threshing floor. It's wheat is separating out the wheat from the chaff. It's an image of judgment. That Jesus, the Messiah, is going to bring judgment and fire on all of those who do not walk with the Lord. This is the preaching of John the Baptist. It's a powerful preaching, isn't it? It's not a kind of preaching I often do. You don't hear me often condemning people. I, and I can if you want. It might be entertaining um, until you're on the uh, receiving end of the condemnation. Then you're like, wait a second. But there's something about that. It's, it's invigorating. It's exciting to have this idea, this image of a preacher who says, we are going to be back to the righteousness of the Lord. This image of who the Messiah is supposed to be for John. This Wednesday, as I watched the news, I wondered, What's the image of the Messiah for those who were storming the Capitol? Who is the Christ of Christian nationalism and these ideals that we saw on Wednesday afternoon? One of the struggles I have with what's been happening in our country is around truth and what is truth. We're at this place where it's hard to even talk about truth. We're at this place where I can hold up this hymnal and I can say, this is a red hymnal. And some of you may say, well, it's actually a shade of red. Um, some of you may say, well, it's a book. It's just a book. And, and those are places we can say, well, there's nuance, but there's different. But if someone comes up and says, no, that's a yellow duck. I don't even know where we can start our conversation. I say, this is a red hymnal, and someone says, no, it's a yellow duck. How do we even begin? And it feels like that's where we are. That some say, here's what is true that's happening in the nation. And others will say, no, here's what is true that's happening in the nation. And our views of truth and our sources of discernment are so diverged that it feels almost impossible to even start a conversation. I'm going to have to be, I don't usually look at my notes when I'm preaching, but... This one was kind of written more recently. And as I watched what was happening on Wednesday, I started to ask myself, who is the Christ of that mob? Who is the Christ of the people who rally behind the rhetoric of Donald Trump? Who is the Christ of the people who rally behind the rhetoric of Joe Biden? Our truths our realities have been shaped by politicians and by news sources. And we have accepted it so much to a degree that having conversations becomes impossible. Who is the Jesus of QAnon? Who is the Jesus of Black Lives Matter? Who is the Jesus of those who said that what we see happening on Wednesday was happening, was going to happen, and we should have expected it? Who is the Jesus of those who are saying the president needs to step down immediately? 
what is the truth that I'm supposed to preach about, the reality that I'm supposed to speak to in a way that we all can hear it. What is real is that we're angry. We're angry because we feel like something has been taken, something has been violated. We're angry and we want to know what is the right thing to do with our anger? What is the right way to respond? And wherever we are with our anger, we want to know that our anger is righteous. That Jesus is with us in our anger. Uh, that the baptism of fire, that winnowing fork of judgment, that demand for repentance will fall, fall upon all of those that we look at with resentment. If there's something that offers us any common ground, it is the anger that we all feel, albeit for various reasons, the lack of control that is intertwined in that anger. We want to cast blame. We want to point our fingers. We want to say that it is someone's fault. Who is our Jesus when we are angry? We're angry about the election for one reason or another. We may feel that it was stolen or we feel that a lack of concession is adding to the pain. We want to shout to the other side and demand that they just see what it is that I see, that you see, and just accept what is blatantly truth, as we say. I lost my page. We're angry because we have seen this country grown in a division that goes to this depth that we can look at the same thing and see something completely different. And we fear what might happen next. And if people would just understand, if they would just see what is true, and reality would then get better. Who is our Jesus when we're angry? Who is the Jesus that we imagine standing next to us, yelling with us? Who is the Jesus when we march and hold our signs and do what we can to persuade people with rhetoric of simple catchphrases, brief moments clinging to truth? We're angry. And in that anger is fear. We're angry and in that anger is hurt. We're angry and in that anger is exhaustion. We're angry and in that anger is a real pain. I wish I could just preach the message of John the Baptist. I wish that I could just preach that we just need to all embrace a baptism of repentance now. So that when Jesus comes with that final fire and judgment, which is going to happen, that we would be ready. I wish that I could just preach with a vindictive eye towards those people that I look at and sputter in exasperation. How could they believe such lies? Isn't that what we all wish we could say in one manner or another? Then who is my Jesus? I can see why people would hear John the Baptist and be seduced and to the message he was preaching, he was doing what he believed was right and was right in preparation. But I can see why it would be so easy just to cling to this message of judgment and damnation. Because it feels like that's where we're leading and maybe we are as a nation. Where all we can now say, instead of saying, I'm going to listen and I'm going to try to understand. Now all we can say is I'm going to judge and I'm going to damn. Who is Jesus for you? Who do you want Jesus to be when you're angry? John the Baptist offers this message of invitation to baptism. And he has an image of it in one way, but I will see soon that it's expanded. There's more going on. But first, Let's take a moment and allow our hearts to settle, our pulses to die down a bit, maybe just mine, maybe everyone else is fine, and imagine ourselves or hear again that invitation to be baptized and to prepare ourselves for the Christ not that we want and the Christ not that we imagine should be, but the one who truly is. Let's sing. Okay, everyone calm down. Did I calm down?
Two verses doesn't feel like enough, does it? Let's get back to the text. Let's get back to the passage. I want to, in verses 18 through 20, it's kind of an insert of the story. It says what happens to John the Baptist. Read that on your own. It's it's very interesting. Uh, I'm going to skip over that and go to verse 21. So we had John the Baptist preaching and he says, this is what Jesus is going to do in this baptism of fire and judgment. And in verse 21, now when all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove and a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved with you. I am well pleased. It's interesting that in this passage, we don't see Jesus getting baptized. It says afterwards, when all the people were baptized and Jesus also had been baptized. Read any of the other Gospels, I believe the other three, have Jesus in the water and at that moment something happens. But here it's afterwards. It's almost as if the baptism is an afterthought. And for someone who is born and bred Baptist, this kind of hurts. I'd like to spend a little more time with the baptism. I'd like to say, have a little more focus on that. Show us how Jesus was baptized. Talk to us about how he was immersed so we can point out to everyone else how we're right and they're wrong. No, that's petty. That's, we don't need to do that. We have plenty of other ways to do that. But it, it almost doesn't become the emphasis. Or there's a humility to it. This sense that Jesus was just baptized with others. Walking with the crowd, accepting that baptism of repentance that John is offering. And then he's he's praying off on his own. He he doesn't have his family there for a baptism celebration. There's no baptism cake, uh, no, no reception afterwards. He gets baptized and then he goes and he prays. It's hard to tell if he's by himself or he's with others who are also praying. But we do have this sense that this was a holy moment for Christ. That this was a moment where something had happened. And maybe this was the first step for him, this dedication to the ministry that he knew he would be embracing. That had been stirring on his heart. But he's praying. I read this as further humility. A quietness. A subtleness. And in this moment, when he's praying, the heaven is opened. And and as we read this, maybe we think back to what John the Baptist was saying about who Jesus was going to be. And maybe we hear, we read, the heaven is opened, and we think, oh, here it is. Here it comes. There's going to be a whole legion of armies that are going to come down. God's voice will be booming. There's going to be trombones and tubas, because apparently those are majestic instruments. I don't know. And it's going to be this moment of triumph. Oh, the heaven opened. And the Holy Spirit descends. The Holy Spirit. And now we have this image of the Spirit, this anointing, this fire that's coming. Like a dove. Like a dove. If I were to think of vicious, scary birds, I think of eagles. I think of vultures. I think of hawks. I don't think of doves. A dove doesn't depict for me this image of triumph. It doesn't have this sense of this victory, of this conquering. Rather, it's become, for us anyways, an image of what? Peace. Or the dove has been, in the, in the Hebrew scriptures, an image of new creation. It is the dove that came to Noah to say, the new life can start. It's the dove that that spreads its wings and flutters its wings in a similar way as we found out in Bible study that God flutters about the beginning of creation, making it happen. There's a newness, but this newness that comes out of a sense of a birth, not this triumph, not this strength. And then a voice from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. We are assured of who Christ is in relationship with God, the Son, the Beloved. We're assured of God's view of Christ, this being, feeling of, play, of being pleased. But for what? 
for this quiet moment of baptism, for this humble movement to prayer, for not embracing what John was preaching, but rather showing a different way to be. Who is it that we want Jesus to be? And who is Jesus really? In this moment, when we're introduced to Jesus, we are given a different picture of what John the Baptist was hoping for or expecting. We're given a different sense of the moment. The fire, the anointing, the Holy Spirit. It's a dove. It's peaceful. Bringing this new sense of life. The announcement of a king and a leader is an announcement of a love and a deep familial, fatherly relationship with God. It's a different image of God. It's a different picture of who God is than we find in the baptism of Christ. God is one of us, being baptized with us, working and living with us, among us, but doing and being something more. One of us, angry with us, bringing us to a different place in our anger. One of us, feeling our fear and our frustration, but leading us in a different direction. One of us, watching those events on Wednesday, seeing, seeing the violence and the destruction and weeping, but calling us to respond with hope. Calling us to respond with hope calling us to respond with hope. Hope that the kingdom which Christ brings is more than just a building. Hope that the kingdom of God is more than a nation or an actual place. Hope that the kingdom of God is more than a flag or a particular person. Hope that the kingdom of God is an action. It is how we act. It is how we listen. It is how we love. It is how we call out actions of violence, speech of violence, but in a way that continues to leave space for that person to find redemption. It is how we speak truth that we see, but in a way that does not look with joy and glee for that fire of judgment. It is how we think first about the least, about the forgotten, and wonder, who is God with them? God is not on the side of one politician or another. Do I need to repeat that? God is not on the side of one politician or party or another. God is not on the side of a platform but is on the side of those who are the least and is with those who lift up the least, who feed the hungry, who share that anointing love of Christ. God is not on the side of those who show strength, who stump their chest saying that they have power so they must be right, but on the side of those who follow his humble steps into the baptismal waters and submit to the ideals and the vision of the kingdom of God. I will be honest, I've been stressing out for the last couple of days about this service, since Wednesday anyways. Tuesday, I was great. I felt good about where we were headed. But I was wondering, what do I preach? How do you approach such a tumultuous moment in our nation's story? What do I offer to you? What advice or guidance can I give? Should I tell you you should call your local representative and have your opinion made known? Sure. Should, I, should you put signs in your front lawn and wear buttons and on your shirt that make, that make your point in smart and snarky ways? Eh, probably not. Should you stop following friends who disagree with you? Eh, stay friends. Should you take a break from social media? Yes, yes you should. But what is the right thing to do in response to this growing and continuing movement and moment in our country of division, of unrest, of anger? Remember your baptism. Remember your baptism. Remember that moment 
when you gave your life to Christ. Because we want Jesus to be our Jesus in the moment. When we're watching the news and we feel this self-righteous kind of indignation, we want to say Christ is with us when we're angry in the way that we want Christ to be with us. But when we remember our baptism and that moment of submission, of giving ourselves to God, then we have to ask Christ, where are you now? For us, for me. Remember that moment when you realize that without Christ, your life was nothing, but with Christ, your life is everything. Remember that moment when you were submerged into those waters. As an infant or an adult, you can remember in a symbolic or real way that moment when you went under and you died for Christ and rose up a new person, a new life, anointed with this fire that brings you a love that we can't know anywhere else. Remember your Baptism and those baptismal vows that we all have made and embraced again and again. When we remember our baptism, then we're called to look at those who we disagree with, those who we look at and we say, how could they not see what is so obvious? And realize that many of them were baptized too. And many of them have made a commitment to Christ as well. And that means we're brothers and sisters. We're brought in that same family. Beyond that, the next step isn't ours, but it is the Lord's. In a moment, we're going to move in the service. We'll go through our prayers and such, but we're moving to the communion table. We're having communion today. It wasn't planned, but last week we had all this other cooking stuff going on. We couldn't add that as well. But boy, it feels that much more right and necessary today. Just as our baptism unites us as all followers of Christ, the table brings us together again and again in that sacred fellowship of followers of Jesus. And when we sit at the communion table... If we haven't realized it by now, we hopefully you have, that it is not about this table. It's not about this space. It's about how our hearts have been changed and how we are all brought up to the table with Christ. It is because of that that we can have communion once a month with those who are at home and know that we are seated side by side. But it also means that when we're having communion, we're having it with those that we disagree with. We're having it with those that we look at with disdain. We're having it with those that we feel so much anger towards. We're all brought again to the table. And after that, we put it in God's hands. Remember your baptism. Remember that moment. Come to the table and see where God leads us next. Amen.